Hi there, and welcome to this video tutorial on writing in Turabian style. My name is Brent, and I'm the learning specialist here at Tyndale, which means that I oversee writing and tutoring services. Now, throughout this video, we're going to be looking at Turabian, one of the major citation styles at Tyndale. And we're going to be looking at what it is, how it functions, how do you format, how do you cite things properly so that as you approach your assignments and your big projects, you're able to do so as effectively and professionally as possible. So let's dive in and look at Turabian in a little more detail. But before we do that, I just want to remind you that writing and tutoring services is something that's a available for you to use as a student. We offer appointments both online and in person, so if you're on campus you can meet with us, or if you want to do so from home, that's totally fine as well. To book with us, simply log into classes.tyndale.ca, click the appointments button in the writing and tutoring services box on the right side of the page, and then you're going to follow the prompts to register if you haven't already, and then to actually book with us there will be a booking calendar where you can choose the date and time that works best for you. One other resource I'm going to share with you towards the end is our academic integrity pages that will cover some of the things we're looking at today in more detail, as well as information about Turabian specifically that you might want to keep in mind for citing. But we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get to the citation piece of this video. So let's actually take a look then at Turabian. What is it? Well, Turabian is an offshoot of the Chicago Manual of Style. Chicago is one of the major citation styles used at Tyndale, and Turabian is considered an offshoot of it, typically reserved for graduate level academic work. As such, uh, one of the main programs that uses Turabian style is the Doctor of Ministry program here at Tyndale for anything that's kind of related to more biblical studies or, or, or the preaching or leadership and those kinds of things. Now, Turabian actually offers two ways to cite information. There's the notes bibliography uh, version, which is actually more typically what we would consider Chicago style proper. So if you are here wanting to know how to write with notes and bibliography, that's footnotes, you're going to want to be focusing more on Chicago style. This probably isn't the video for you. But if your professor is asking you for Turabian style, most likely what they mean is the second version, the author date style. And that's what we're going to look at in more detail today. Now we're going to talk about citing and what that actually look like that author date idea actually means. But first I want to look at some formatting features. So let's start with the title page. Every assignment that you submit at Tyndale should probably have a title page. I know Turabian has a, a rule that if it's less than six pages, you don't technically need a title page, but I think it's a good practice to get into and a habit to build as you submit your assignments. So you're going to want to include the following information on your title pages. You're going to start at the top of the page with the name of the university, in our case, Tyndale University. A little bit later, you're going to look at the title and the subtitle of your paper. Now, please note the way this is structured. Uh, oftentimes, when you have things like headings or titles in Turabian, you want to do so according to inverted pyramid style. That's an upside down pyramid. So as you can see, the first line is longer, the second line is shorter. If I ever mention that, that's what you want to pay attention to. There's then going to be this little like paragraph type thing where over four lines you're going to say an assignment submitted in partial fulfillment of whatever your course name is, and then you might provide additional school information, which branch of the school, graduate studies, seminary, etc. that you're, you're part of. You'll then give the professor's name with four before it your name with by before it, and then you're going to give the city and country of the university followed by the due date. Now, as I said, this is something you want to keep in mind for every title page you do. Note that there's a little bit of space between each of those things. I usually like to say about two inches that you're looking at like two enter keys, give or take, maybe three, depending on uh, how you've got it set up. And note that actually everything here, if it has multiple lines to a section, is double spaced. Which brings us to another important formatting feature. Double space your entire document. That's your title page, your actual information, your, your reference list, which we'll talk about later. All of it needs double spacing. Uh, some other formatting features at the beginning of a paragraph, you're going to want to indent that paragraph by half or so the first line of that paragraph, I should say, by half an inch. Uh, very easy way to do that. Put your cursor at the beginning of the paragraph and hit tab once. Uh, with that, don't leave additional space after the uh, a paragraph finishes. So if you when you're done a paragraph, you shouldn't have like a blank line. Uh, it'll be double spaced. So of course, there will be like blank lines between each line, but you shouldn't have additional spacing before the next paragraph. Instead, simply let that tab or that extra half inch indent uh, notify your reader that you're starting a new paragraph. 
For most papers you write in Turabian, you're going to want to stick to a one inch margin on either side. That's top, bottom, left and right. Also 2.54 centimeters if you're going that route. Uh, the exception to that would be some of the very high end academic work. That's your portfolios or dissertation level work. Uh, that's going to have a two inch margin on the left side, but there's going to be separate resources available to you if you're looking for formatting on that. So for the most part, anything you can, you're hearing in this video, you can assume will be applying to standard assignments that you may be submitting. Another thing to keep in mind is the font. Try to stick to a standard font. Most Tyndale professors want and expect 12 point times New Roman font. And there are a few others that are acceptable, but I recommend sticking with this one since it's what most professors will be expecting you to do anyway. If you ever refer to titles over the course of your your work, um, there's two different ways to do so. For longer books, uh, journals, things like that, the longer works, you're going to use italics for your title and then make sure that all of the major words are capitalized. Um, but if it's a shorter work, something like an article or a chapter title, maybe an essay title, things that are not an entire book, but just one little piece, that's going to be um, in quotation marks rather than italics and again, capitalize all the major words. Uh, one other major formatting feature in uh, Turabian you want to pay attention to is headings. Uh, so Turabian recommends headings for papers of six pages or longer. Anything less than six pages, you would probably don't want to include headings in simply because there's already not a lot of space. Um, the idea is in a five, four, three page paper, you don't really need to be subdividing into various sections because almost everything is going to probably be focused around one or two bigger ideas anyway. But for anything else, follow these guidelines. Um, you're going to want to leave two blank single spaced lines before and after each um, each heading. So what that means is that when you've double spaced your document, there's going to be like the like a line of text and then the equivalent of a blank line and then a line of text and a blank line. What we're asking for before and after headings is actually two blank lines immediately before and immediately after. The exception again to this is chapter headings, which has it set up that you do 72 points before. Uh, that's about six lines before blank and then 12 line point afterwards. Again, there will be a separate video covering some of that formatting. One other really key thing in Turabian is you don't want to be putting two headings back to back. By that I mean you don't want to have like, uh, um, we call them levels in headings. You don't want to have a level one heading and then a level two heading immediately right after one after another. Uh, at the very least, there should be some sort of text separating them, even if it's a single sentence. But you want to have something, you want to have like your level one heading, some sort of text, and then a level two heading. The levels will make sense in a moment. I'm going to show you what they look like in a second. Um, if for whatever reason you're at the end of a page and uh, you want to put a heading in there and you're like, oh, well, the bottom line is going to be the heading and then the information starts on the following page, move the heading to the next line. Leave a couple of blank spaces on that, uh, that page before and then just simply move the heading to the next line. And as I said with the title page, same here is if for whatever reason your headings go over to two lines, make sure it's inverted pyramid style. The top line is longer than the second line. If there happens to be a third line, that should be even smaller still. OK, so let's actually take a look at what headings typically look like. So as you can see here, I've given you an example of a chapter heading. Uh, the spacing here is not correct. Remember, you're going to make sure you have two lines before, two lines after. Stick with me. But you're going to have for chapter headings, uh, it will be centered and all capitalized. And then these levels here are the main headings you're going to use. Think of each level as being equal in importance. So if you have a um, if you have kind of like four major sections to your paper, four arguments that you're trying to make in an argumentative paper, or four um, sections of your life that you're covering in a, in your spiritual journey, uh, those are going to be considered equal level to each other. Those four divisions. Uh, if you then are going down a level, what that means is that within one of those big categories, you have a couple of subcategories, two, three, four, however many, and those would all be equal. And if in within a subcategory, you even have sub subcategories, then you're moving on to level three and so on. So try and make sure that all of your headings are are formatted according to what is of equal importance in your paper.
Uh, as you can see, level one is going to be centered and bolded, whereas level two is simply centered, no bolds, no italics. And um, levels three and four are bold and regular font, but now we've shifted over to the left side of the page. And if you happen to get down to level five, which I don't recommend doing often, you're going to need to have a lot of sub, 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 sub categories for that to work. Uh, if you happen to get to level five, though, what you'll do is you'll set it up almost like a heading as part of your paragraph. So you indent it, you give the heading, notice that these are not title style capitalization like all the other ones. It's almost formatted like a sentence, but bolded. Uh, and then it ends with a period. And then you don't start on a new line. You just immediately dive in for level five with uh, with the, the the rest of your paragraph. To give you an example of what that might look like in a paper, again, keeping in mind there should be text in between each of these. You would have information that you've written uh, to elaborate on stuff. Uh, you would have for here uh, the level one headings of personal spiritual journey and leadership goals. What that means is this heading here and this heading here are of equal importance. You have your first section of your paper, which is your spiritual journey. The second section of your paper is leadership goals. Now, within personal spiritual journey, however, we have a breakdown. We have four um, subsections of, of the parts of your life that make up your spiritual journey. You have childhood, young adult life, midlife crisis, and approaching retirement. You can see why those would be considered equal importance. They're four distinct time periods. And then within young adult life, we've actually subdivided it even further. You can talk about like your university life and starting in the workforce. Those get level three headings. Now, some of you might be sitting here thinking, okay, that's great and all, Brent, but you've talked a little bit about um, like extra spacing before and afterwards and, and bolding. And is that something I have to do manually every single time? No, it is not. So let me just quickly show you on Microsoft Word a way that you can actually avoid some of the, the manual setting up of headings. So here we are in Microsoft Word. So let's let's actually use the example we just did before. Let's say you wanted to do the level one heading, personal spiritual journey. Um, there we are. I can't spell. There you go. Thank you, autocorrect. Uh, as you can see right now, it's standard font. It's to the left. This is not what we want for a level one heading. The way we actually set it up is you're going to go ahead and you're going to uh, use some of the tools up here. So you see how it says home. And then all the way like towards the right over here, we have this style section. You're gonna wanna take advantage of these. So if we go over heading one, think of that as level one, I'm just hovering, I haven't clicked anything yet, but you'll see that it's all of a sudden changed something on the document. As you can see also, that's not what we want. It's kind of blue, it looks like the size went bigger. We wanna make sure we change that. So what you can do is you can actually right click on this heading one piece and click modify. When you do that, it's going to bring up this vi this um, this box over here, and you're going to have the opportunity to mess with some of the settings and make sure that it's formatted according to what Turabian wants. So you can go ahead and click here and change it to Times New Roman. You can change it to 12 point font. Uh, we know that level one headings are supposed to be bolded, so we'll click the little bold button. We don't want it to be blue. Instead, we want it to be black. It's blue. Blue often is Microsoft's default one, so make sure you change it to black. Uh, we know that level one headings are supposed to be centered. And then there's one other piece of this that we want to make sure we're doing correctly, and that's to get the spacing right. As I said, it's supposed to have two single spaced lines beforehand. So we're actually going to manipulate that a little bit. So if you go into this formatting box at the very bottom left corner and hit paragraph, it'll open another window for you. Uh, and what we want to do is we actually want to change the spacing here. We want to change the line spacing to double. So it's consistent with the rest of our document. Remember, double spacing. And then here where it says before and after, you wanna change both of them to 12 point font. 12 point font. What this does, 12 points again, is the regular font of our document. It's basically saying add an additional line before and after. From here, we can click okay. Uh, and you can actually click okay here. If you wanted to, you can also set this to be uh, new documents based on this template. What that will do is that every single time you open Microsoft Word, it will have this heading saved for you. So if you're like, oh man, I, want, I don't wanna do this every single time I submit an assignment. If you click this button right here, it's going to actually save that for you so that you can use it going forward in the future. I'm not going to because I use this for other things as well, but keep that in mind if you want to. So I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. 
And you might be like, well, nothing happened. It's still the same. That's because we didn't do anything here. We just modified the heading. So now if I click on the, the, the line we want to change, and then I go ahead and click on this heading one, see? Automatically it formats everything for you. It's given the extra little space at the beginning and at the end. It's bolded, it's centered. And if we hit enter and start on a new line, this is where the document will go. As you can see, there's a good amount of space here. If I fill in this document uh, with other text, it will be single space. Now, again, this is where I want to talk about a few of the formatting things. We don't want this to be single spaced, right? We talked about wanting it to be double spaced. How do we change that? You can actually go again under the home tab. You can go ahead and click on paragraph. See this little box in the corner? It kind of looks like a box with an arrow. Uh, you're going to click that. And it's going to bring up that paragraph thing again we saw before. You're going to want to change it so that line spacing here, just like we did before, is double. If you want, you can set it as default for all documents, or you can go ahead and click OK, and it will automatically do things for you. Now it will be double spaced. Lovely. One other thing I just want to mention while I'm here, because I forgot to mention it earlier, uh, you can also want to make sure that you include page numbers in all of your uh, your work for, for Turabian. Page numbers in Turabian actually go at the bottom of the page, and they're going to be in the center. How do you put in page numbers? You can go ahead to this Insert tab, uh, and then about uh, three quarters of the way on the right, you're going to see Page Number. And then you're going to go to the bottom of page thing and hit plane number two. That's going to automatically include your page numbers. Now there's information you're going to need to know about page numbers with your final portfolios and things like that. That gets a little more complicated, but for now, this is all you're going to need to know is how do you include page numbers on the bottom of the page? And that's going to give you some of the basic formatting that you need for headings and just general formatting for how to set up your papers. But now let's go back to the PowerPoint for the next little formatting piece. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is figures and tables. Uh, figures and tables are things that you're going to sometimes be bringing into your assignments. Maybe you have a diagram that you've built for an assignment. Maybe there's data you've collected from um, a survey you've done, from uh, uh, like census data you've gathered for, say, your denomination, things like that. Um, so there are going to be times you're going to want to bring that data into your text. So let's just talk a little bit about what that looks like. Anytime you bring up a figure or a table, you're going to refer to them with lowercase letters uh, and then a number. So as you can see here, as noted in table six, um, if you're going to be bringing in, uh, sometimes it will be part of your text like this. It's actually going to be in brackets. Same deal. You can actually make it smaller. Fig eight, tab eight, whatever the case may be. If you're wondering what the difference is, a table is usually reserved for things like um, charts or actual tables, the things where you have like numbers and then data listed. Uh, anything else, graphs, images, things like that, that's gonna be considered a figure. Uh, when you're building your figures and tables, uh, you're often going to include a caption before or afterwards. Think of it kind of like a, t a title for the thing that's explanatory for it. Uh, captions or titles for tables are going to go before the table begins, and then captions and titles for figures are going to go after the figure. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. Uh, so as you can see here, we've got the table. Ignore this for now. Uh, we've got the table here. We've got table 1.1. The only difference there is if it's like it's table one in chapter one. So it's the chapter number comes first, the the figure number comes second. If or sorry, the table number comes second. If you find yourself in the need of doing that, and then the title of the table is listed afterwards. You provide the table, you give the information, and you can see here that if necessary, you can provide some additional descriptive information. Let's say you took the table from somewhere. In that case, you're going to want to reference it properly. We're going to talk about the importance there. You've got here source in italics, data from, and then you would include your reference entry, the whole thing. And then sometimes you might want to be including little notes to, to describe the information in more detail. I've given you an example of almost like a footnote note here where it's like uh, this individual piece of data needs a little bit of a description. So we actually create it like almost a footnote. Or if you want to make a general comment about the entire table, you would do so by doing the in italics the word note and then a colon and then you would provide the note about the whole table. 
I cheated a little bit with this caption at the bottom because it's not an image, but let's pretend this was a picture of like a goat or something. I don't know why you'd need that in your assignment, but there you go. Uh, if this was a picture or a graph or something else, you would put the figure number, maybe 1.1 1 .1, uh, or whatever, the, the, one, the number point number at the bottom, again, with the title or caption of the figure. So make sure that um, tables, that's again, charts, tables, goes up here. Anything else, graphs, images, etc. It's going to be with figure at the bottom. A few other things to keep in mind when you're dealing with figures and tables. Um, you're probably not going to use them as frequently in your uh, regular assignments, but they may come up from time to time. But especially when you're dealing with things like your final portfolio, if you have figures and tables, you're going to want to include a list of them in your front matter. It'll be a separate doc, a separate page that's uh, got the information there that tells your reader how many different things, tells you what pages they're on, that kind of a thing. But again, for your regular assignments, this is not probably something you're going to run into as frequently. What you do need to make sure of, however, is that whenever you include a table or a figure, it needs to fit within the margins of your paper. So you don't want that table or that figure to be expanded into the margin so that it goes from like edge of sheet to edge of sheet. You want to make sure there's that one inch buffer on either side. Uh, this is especially important for your portfolios when that left margin shrinks or, or sorry, your left margin grows. That means you're going to have less space for the table. So you have to make sure you format, adjust columns, adjust the size of the image accordingly. Whenever possible, make sure you include the figure or the table immediately following the paragraph where that thing is listed. So as we said, you're going to write in your document as seen in figure one or in brackets, you'll say table six or whatever the case may be, right? Ideally, you should include that table or that figure immediately following the paragraph you mentioned it. It's not always possible because of formatting reasons. Uh, in that case, do it as quickly as possible. You might do it on the next page after the next paragraph so that it's there, uh, but try. maybe it has to go before occasionally just because you want to keep it uh, close by, but try as much as possible to be formatting it so that it's right after the paragraph that you mentioned it. This is something you probably want to save to do until you're happy with the content because if edits happen, then the figure might move and stuff. So, so this is something you might think about putting in right at the end of your paper before you submit. And one final thing about figures and tables, if you are bringing in a table or a figure from another work, just be mindful of some of the rules there. Just like with any other information, you need to provide the source, you need to provide me all the citation information where you got that thing from. Uh, but keep in mind that tables and figures usually fall under different copyright rules and different copyrights uh, than the rest of the book. Uh, so it's set up that if you want to bring in information from a book, copyright law allows you to do so in most cases, um, simply as long as you provide credit where credit is due. With figures and tables, however, they often fall under different copyrights. You often, as a result, need to receive permission from the original author of the table, from the person who took the photograph that's in your figure, whatever the case may be. So just I, what I would recommend is you're probably not going to bring in a lot of external tables and figures regularly because it is a lot more complicated. Try to stick to information that either you've created, tables that you've gathered, because then you're the owner of that information. Okay, now I've been talking a little bit about credit where credit is due and, and when you're allowed to use information. And that's actually now what I want us to move into. We're gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about citation. Uh, and I do wanna spend some time on this because I find that a lot of students, um, they come to university, they come to even graduate level work, and, and they think they have an idea of what this is supposed to look like. And sometimes it's a little bit mistaken. Um, people who have grown up in uh, North American education systems can have confusion here. Uh, uh, and I especially see some things for students from other countries who come here and and the way that they work with other sources is simply different. Sometimes uh, the rules they have or the expectations they have is different than here in North America. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Why? Because if you get this wrong, what we're dealing with is essentially stealing. Uh, if you uh, take somebody else's ideas or words and claim them as your own, even if that's unintentionally, what you're doing is you're plagiarizing. You're stealing that person's words or ideas if you don't give credit and you don't do it in the proper way. So again, it's very important that we're all on the same page about how to do this properly so that you can uh, you can tackle your work uh, professionally. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this. What is citation dealing with? Any time that you take information from another source, you have to cite it. 
Uh, there's kind of two different ways that you have to cite things. There's through in-text citation, which is telling me immediately after the sentence where you got that information from. That's what we're going to talk about now. And then there's also the need to include all of the things that you've referenced in a big list at the end. We'll talk about that later. Let's talk about in-text citation then. Any time that you, uh, every time that you quote something, you paraphrase something, you you bring in information from another source, you're going to want to reference that thing using an in-text citation that involves the author date system. This is why it's Turabian author date. You're going to want to include three pieces of data. You want to include the author's last name, the year of publication, and then the page number where you got that information from. And there's kind of two ways to set that up in Turabian. It's through narrative citations and through parenthetical citations. So let's look at both. Narrative citations use what we call signal phrases to incorporate the author's name as part of your sentence. So oftentimes it's going to look something like this. Smith explained, according to Smith, according to author. Uh, but notice how we've done this here. So Smith, bracket, 2010, comma, 58 bracket explained. In other words, we give the author's name and then immediately afterwards we provide the year of publication, a comma, and the page number where you got that information from. Same here, according to Smith, bracket 2010, 58. You have to include the information immediately afterwards. Now there's lots of different words that you can do to kind of set up these signal phrases. I've got a number of them here, claimed, asserted, stated, demonstrated, added, noted, argued, explained, insisted. I'm not going to read all of them, but notice one thing. All of these have been given in past tense and the vast majority of what you're writing for your documents will be in past tense. Maybe not quite all of it, but most of it. Anything you're talking about, research that you've done, information that you've considered, it's almost always going to be in the past tense. So you keep this in mind when you're setting up your citations. This is a perfectly a legitimate way of doing so. You put the author's name as part of your sentence and then you give the credit where credit is due right afterwards. But sometimes that's just not natural. Sometimes you don't want to give the author's credit as part of your sentence. Maybe you're just talking about something and it naturally flows into a quote that you picked up from somewhere else. In that case, all of the information needs to be included in brackets at the end of the sentence. So here's an example. Ideally, environmental concerns should be considered in all aspects of the hiring process. Bracket, author's name or names, the year of publication, comma, page number, end bracket, period. This setup is really important. Notice that we have the author's names here, the year of publication, a comma, no comma between the author's names and the year of publication, but there is a comma after the year, the page number, no P dot, no PG dot, nothing like that. Just give the page number, the bracket, and then the period. Punctuation for the sentence comes after your in-text citation. That's really key. Similar with quotations, if you're going to give them, lead into them with your own words first. There has been, quote, an increasing focus on the role of land, end quote, in policy debates, yada, 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 bracket, author's names, year of publication, comma, page number, end bracket, period. Always that system whenever you're referencing somebody else. Now, we've given an example here of a quote down below and a paraphrase, so let's just take a little bit of time to understand why you use these two different things for a quotation. Quotations are really good if you want to give extra authority or credibility to your argument. The reality is, is that your, your papers, your assignments, your portfolios are going to be based on your arguments and opinions, but just you is probably not enough to make the arguments valid. Uh, if you are listening to somebody talk and they are just sharing their opinion with you, that's fine. But if you all of a sudden hear that this person has quoted an authority in the field, somebody who knows what they're talking about, suddenly you give a little bit more um, attention to their, their theories. So that's where quotations can be good. They're also good if there's a certain word or phrase that you want to capture exactly, or maybe something the author said is particularly memorable. In that case, it's probably worth giving it in quotations. Give the exact wording, because that is what quotations are, right? The exact wording of the author. Sometimes, however, you might quote because you just want to provide further analysis, or maybe there's something somebody said where you completely disagree, and you actually want to you wanna show that in considerable detail. 
In that case, it's worthwhile quoting the original author, give their exact words, and then you can go into your explanation and elaboration of the various points, or you can do like a sentence, quote the idea, show where you think it's problematic, then quote the next part of the idea, show where you think it's problematic. These can be very good for uh, like rhetorically working through the ideas you want to address. Just remember that you can have too much of a good thing. Quotations are great, but if you do them too frequently, there's not gonna be enough of your own words, your own thoughts. So, so try to remember that quotations are supposed to be serving a purpose in your paper, not simply copying and pasting large chunks of somebody else's work into your paper. I like to think that a good, uh, a good rule of thumb is try not to quote more than a sentence or two at a time. Uh, and we'll explain a little bit more later about why that is. Uh, in terms of quoting, we've already shown some examples here, but I just want to show some more. Uh, if it's a short quotation, by that I mean four or fewer lines in your paper, uh, then it can be just directly part of your paragraph like so. Introduce with your own words, even if that's a signal phrase, and then go. So these authors here, remember the, the year of publication, we'll come back to this in a moment, suggest that quote, mood regulation, blah, 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 is necessary to leave a positive legacy, period, end quote. Notice there's no page number at the end because um, of what's going on here. Again, I'll explain in a second. Another example, at least one, uh, this is where we do the parenthetical citations, at least one Reformation theologian, Calvin, argues that spiritual formation starts with, quote, knowing God as Trinity, as Father, Son, and Spirit, end quote, give the reference, period. The first example there where we have that organizational stewardship line, uh, the reason that's there is because this is an electronic source that doesn't have page numbers. And when that happens, if you have a source that either doesn't have page numbers or the page numbers change whenever you increase the font or something like that, you obviously can't give page numbers. So then we fall back on something else. You might do paragraph numbers, para dot four, if the paragraphs are numbered. Uh, you might give a section title, a chapter title, a chapter number. Basically, you're trying to give the smallest identifiable marker so that if your reader, your professor wants to go back to it later and double check your information, it's just easier for them to find it. So that's an example of if it's a short quotation. But what about if it's long? Uh, again, I recommend being careful with doing a lot of long quotations. Again, you want the information to be, um, you want your information to still be more of the focal point. But let's say that you do need to include a longer quotation. This is what you would do. For five or more lines, you'll use block formatting. So again, this is an example of a narrative citation. We've got the author's name, the year of publication, and the page number as part of it. And then as you get to the end of the thing, you see your quote, uh, or we see the quote introduced with a colon. And then you provide the quotation here. Now notice two things. There is no quotation marks here. Not at the beginning, not at the end. That's because uh, the block formatting like we've got here is actually showing to your reader that this is what's going on. What is that formatting? It's that the entire quotation is indented half an inch in line with the beginning of a paragraph. How do you do that? Let's say you have your quotation in Microsoft Word, put your cursor on the second line of the thing and hit tab and it will move the entire quotation in half an inch. So no quotation marks, indented half an inch, and then notice here that when we finish our quotation, we just dive straight in with our text again. We don't indent this because this isn't the beginning of a new paragraph. All of this is one paragraph. It's just that this is formatted to be indented half an inch. So for the most part, you don't want to be just suddenly starting a new paragraph here. Continue going with the same idea because this sentence and the sentences that follow will be helping to explain this paragraph. Again, more on that in a moment. Just a note that if you aren't doing a signal phrase, all all of this information, the parenthetical citation, would go here. Uh, but for once, the period will always be here, and then you give your reference. You don't want to be um, putting the period afterwards. I don't know why they do that for block quotations, but that's what they do here. So introduce with a colon, no quotation marks, indent the whole thing half an inch, and then keep going as if it's the same paragraph, no indent immediately afterwards. A couple of final points about quotations. Try not to start sentences with a quotation. As I've said before, always introduce them with your own words first because you want that 
Um, you want the quotation to be part of your ideas, and you do that by introducing with your own words first. Similarly, try not to start or end paragraphs with quotations. There are exceptions to this. Occasionally, you do so at the beginning of, say, an introduction because you really want to like emphasize a point. But for the most part, you want your quotations to be serving as evidence to the ideas you're trying to communicate, not simply starting a paragraph with an idea that somebody else said. This is where this idea of point proof analysis comes from. Uh, when you're writing papers, you always want to have in your paragraphs a point that you're communicating. You want to then prove that point, provide evidence. Often this is where the quotation comes in. And then you're going to analyze that proof. Uh, you're going to follow up your quotation with a sentence or two explaining how that quotation, how that evidence proves whatever the point is of that paragraph. Again, this is why it's hard to use quotations at the beginning or end of paragraphs, because the beginning of the paragraph is often where you express your point. And then if you put a quotation at the end of a paragraph, you haven't provided room for analysis. So as much as possible, try to keep your quotations more as evidence in the middle of your paragraphs. So that's quotations. Now let's take a look at paraphrases. A paraphrase is where you take the author's idea but then you rephrase it in your own words. And there's kind of a few really important things here. Uh, when you paraphrase something, it needs to be with entirely different wording. By that, I mean you can't just replace every couple of words with a synonym, or change one or two words here and there, and then call it a day. That's not good enough. It needs to be entirely different wording in your sentence. And it should also be written according to an entirely different sentence structure. Uh, what that means is that as you're going through your paraphrase, you shouldn't be covering the, the same ideas in the same order that the original sentence does. You want to move things around. Maybe the beginning of the sentence originally becomes the end of your paraphrase, or maybe the middle gets moved to the beginning. Just move things around. And yet in all of this, it still needs to capture the original point's essence. You still want to make sure it sounds like whatever the original idea uh, was trying to communicate. Now, Turabian likes a balance of quotations and paraphrases. I find a lot of times quotations are good, maybe like once a page or so. Again, it kind of depends on what you're doing. Sometimes you need to do a little bit more quoting. Sometimes you might have a section where you do a lot more paraphrasing, but, but trying to find a balance there is really good. And, uh, but basically what I'm saying is don't only quote. In fact, you probably will have more paraphrases on the whole than you will have quotations in your do final documents. How then do you paraphrase effectively? Because it's important. If we're going to be doing it a lot, how do we paraphrase effectively? Well, careful note taking when you're actually reading your sources matters a lot here. Uh, so I like to think of this as it's kind of like a four or five step process. First, as you're reading the text and you've come across an idea that's really good, ask yourself, what does that source mean? What does this idea mean that I just read in the sentence? It's a little bit like as a pastor when you're explaining to the congregation, uh, this is what this verse of scripture basically means, you're doing the same thing here. You're rewording it, you're rephrasing it in such a way that you would be able to communicate to somebody else who's maybe not as familiar, this is what this idea means. So once you kind of have that idea in your head, then minimize your page or close your book so that you're not looking at the original sentence anymore then go ahead and write down a draft paraphrase. Uh, do this from memory, because this way you're not going to be tempted to just change a word here and a word there. You're going to be forced to recreate what that idea was and what you felt it means for yourself. And then once you've written that draft paraphrase, that's when you can go back, cross-check your notes, look to see, okay, is the idea that I've just expressed in my draft paraphrase, is it accurate? to what the original source was saying? Is it too similar? Do I need to change the wording? Do I need to change the sentence structure? That's the opportunity to do so. And then make sure that you cite it. Please include the author's last name, page number, year of publication. Get that information down, because if you don't do that, even if you've paraphrased it well, even if you've changed everything properly, if you don't include that citation, we're dealing with issues of plagiarism. Remember, plagiarism is every time you take somebody's words or ideas. So make sure you change it effectively. Make sure that you cite it properly. Otherwise, plagiarism. Let's give some examples here. Uh, I have two quotes on this page. I'm going to, in a moment, pause the video and give you the chance to read both of these paragraphs. And what I want you to do is, is kind of look at the two and figure out what is the problem with the paraphrase? How is it incorrect? How has it not done the job of paraphrasing effectively? So pause the video, read these two paragraphs, and then we'll take it up in a second. 
Okay, I just want to read the beginning of each of these just so you get an idea of maybe where some things have gone wrong. In the original, students frequently overuse. The paraphrase, students often use. Hmm, similar. They overuse direct quotation. They use too many direct quotations. Ooh, that's a lot of similar wording. In taking notes, when they take notes, and as a result, resulting in. Uh, are, are you kind of hearing the problem here? It's like we're basically taking every second or third word and just changing it a little bit, frequently to often, direct quotation to direct quotations, in taking when they take. Like it, it's, it's different, but it's too similar in the wording. This would be considered plagiarism because you haven't actually changed the sentence enough. It would actually be better at this point that you just quote the entire thing because I'd rather you stick with the original wording if you're going to be that similar. Remember, it needs to be a completely different wording. Let's do this again. Here's a second example of a paraphrase. Pause the video. How is this second paraphrase considered illegitimate? What is it doing wrong? Okay, so this is the bit of a trick compared to the last one I started at the beginning. Here you had to read all the way to the end. I just want you to take a look at the last sentence of both of these. Therefore, to avoid this pitfall and ready, because you can read from either side, you should strive to limit the amount of exact transcribing of source materials while taking notes. The back half of this paraphrase is exactly the same as the original source. This would be plagiarism because this is actually not paraphrasing anymore. Now you're just quoting, but you haven't put in the quotation marks. You haven't done so properly. Again, doing this can have very serious ramifications. You don't want to be messing around with plagiarism. So make sure if there is a chunk of your sentence that is word for word the same, quote it. That's better. Otherwise, change it so that it sounds very different. So let's give an example of what that might look like. I have here our paraphrase, Lester, note the narrative citation, observe that in research papers, students tend to quote excessively, failing to keep quoted material down to a suitable level. Students can avoid falling into this trap, he explained, by minimizing the words recorded during the note-taking stage. Yes, there's some overlap here. We have while taking notes, during the note-taking stage. There's definitely a little bit of overlap in some of the wording, but if you read these two back to back, the wording is very different. It covers things in a different order. It expresses similar ideas, but it does so in a very different way. It's it's really trying to capture the meaning of this first point and re-express it in a new way. That's what you want to be doing with your paraphrasing. So then as we approach, you know, paraphrasing especially, but also quoting and doing this correctly, how do we avoid unintentional plagiarism? Because again, we don't want to be dealing with plagiarism. Anytime that happens, we can be dealing with zeros on assignments and courses. And if you, if this becomes a struggle that comes up multiple times, you can even be expelled from the school. So we don't want to be in that, that dangerous situation. So how do we make sure that we don't even unintentionally plagiarize? Well, when you're taking notes, when you're going through your documents, don't copy everything word for word. Sure, if there's a really a powerful sentence, you can copy and paste that. That's fine. Put that down in your notes, have the quotation. But for the most part, as you're taking your notes, do it like we talked about with the paraphrasing. Go back and base, do it based off of memory rather than simply like copying one word for one word, changing a few here and there. Um, the other thing you're going to want to do when you're taking notes is make sure you always include what source and page number you got the information from. You don't have to necessarily do a full in-text citation, but it's worthwhile to maybe when you're taking notes on a document, put the author's last name and page number and maybe the title of the article so you can find it easy at the top. And then as you go through every single time you take a note, to remind yourself what page you got it from so that when you're going back to fill in your paper later you have a very ease you have ease of access to to find where you got that information from when you're actually writing cite as you write don't wait until the end of the document and then put your citations in do them as you write at the very least put the page number and the author's name down you can fill the year in later but have that information there so that you don't accidentally miss something when you reread it's very easy to do it's like oh i'll just cite the sentences later and then you miss one and then you get caught for plagiarism and that's the last thing we want to see happen
In that vein, read, reread, and reread it again. Make sure that as you are going over your document before you submit, pay special attention to things that have been paraphrased or to sections of your paper where you're like, that doesn't really sound like me. Am I sure that that was my idea or did I actually take it from somewhere else? Make sure that you're paying that attention, spending that time adjusting your paraphrases if necessary so that you can submit work that has been done to the proper level of academic integrity. And my final piece of advice is if you have a piece of information and you're like, I don't actually know if this needs citing or not. If you're not sure, cite it. It is better to bother your professor with a little bit of oversighting than to get called for plagiarism because you undersighted something. Now with that, we can finally move on to the second piece of this like referencing talk. So we've talked about in-text citation. What do you do when you quote and you paraphrase something? Now I wanna just look very quickly at your reference list. A reference list is an alphabetized list of every source that you've used in your paper. You may have heard it called a bibliography in other citation styles, but in Turabian author date, we're dealing with reference list. Just like the rest of your document, you're going to double space the page, uh, but this is going to be a little bit different compared to paragraphs. You're going to actually use what we call hanging indent. This means that the entries start flush with the margin on the left side of the page, but then subsequent lines are indented half an inch. Let me give you an example of that in Word. Okay, so here we are on our Word document again. We have a sample here of our reference list. As you can see, it's double spaced, but now we wanna make sure we set up the hanging indent. To do that, you can go ahead and click and drag over this, and if you wanted to over any other citations or reference entries that you have on your document, Click and drag so they're all covered. And then you're going to go ahead up here again to the Home tab under Paragraph, that little box we had before in the bottom right corner. And here we're going to want to use this indentation piece. Indentation under Special. You can actually go ahead and click Hanging. As you can see, it's done there. We hit OK. And it will automatically format things for you. The first line is flush with the margin. Subsequent lines are here. And let's say we were starting another one by Johnson. As you can see, the next one on the next line immediately flush with the left again. So that's how you can set up your uh, hanging indents so that your reference lists are done effectively. It's important to remember that your reference list is only going to com be comprised of sources that you've actually used. So these are the sources that you've actually quoted, paraphrased, summarized, anything that you've included explicitly in your paper, that's what goes in your reference list. If you read an article that like it kind of adjusted your thinking a little bit, but you never actually referenced that article, don't include it in your reference list, it's not needed. And as you may have seen in the example we just did, you're going to want to use title style capitalization. This is where all major words are capitalized, as well as the first letter of your title and subtitle, uh, if there is one. Now, I could give you a lot of like verbal explanations of how to do the reference entries, but I think I may as well just show you. And to do that, I also want to show you a little bit about the academic integrity pages that we have on the Tyndale website, where you can get some of this information for yourself. So here we are on the Tyndale Academic Integrity pages. That's going to be tyndale.ca slash academic dash integrity. As you can see, uh, some of the things we've talked about today, like quoting and paraphrasing, citing and referencing, all of that is explained in more detail here. You'll be able to see an example of how to do it for yourself. Uh, but the thing I really like about these pages that we've built recently is our different citation style guides. The one we're going to be using, of course, today is going to be the Turabian author date one. You can go ahead and click on that, and it's going to give you an entire breakdown of how Turabian works. Uh, it's going to have things like formatting for title pages and headings and page numbers. Uh, it'll have the fonts. It'll give you information on how do you cite those in-text citations that we talked about, how to do block quotations, how to build your reference lists, and then... On the side here, we have my little like table of contents. Uh, this is going to set you up to look up different kinds of resources that you may use throughout the course of your program in order to um, how to cite those kinds of references or those kinds of sources properly. So let me go through a few examples with you. Let's say that you have an ebook that you got from the Tyndale Library uh, and you want to know how to reference that properly in your text. You can go here to the books, ebooks, and chapter section. Here you're going to see an example of exactly how you cite an ebook. So you're going to have a narrative citation over here. You're going to have your parenthetical citations, and then you're going to have a breakdown of the actual way that you you put it in the reference entry. 
uh, we have an example of using a template and then we have an example of an, uh, what a source like that might actually look like. So I really like the template because it tells you exactly what to do. You have last name, comma, first name, period. Then you have the year, period. You have the title of a book in italics, period. Publishing city, colon, publishing company, period. And then the DOI and URL number. Uh, you're going to want to choose what you use carefully. If possible, use the DOI number. This refers to the digital object identifier. Um, oftentimes, journal articles or ebooks will have them. But if it doesn't, then you can use a URL. Just make sure you aren't using necessarily what's in the top of the page in the address bar, because sometimes that changes. Most journal articles and ebooks will have uh, a button for a stable URL or a permalink or something like that. That's what you're going to want to use. And again, you have an example here of what it actually looks like. Scrolling down, we also have an example of a chapter or an essay in an anthology. This is another type of uh, source you're going to use a lot. Maybe you are doing a collection of essays uh, and you just want one essay. In that case, you're going to do the last name, comma, first name of the chapter or the essay that you're citing the year that it was published, and then the title of the chapter or the essay. Note that carefully. It's whatever that chapter is called in title of the anthology in bra or in italics, comma, edited by whatever the editor's names. Those are usually going to be the names that appear on the front of the book. This is followed after a comma with the page range, and then again, the publishing city and the publishing company. Um, okay, so that's what we would use for ebooks or chapters and anthologies. Let's go back up, look at another common example. Uh, you might be dealing with things like commentaries in Turabian a lot. You're bringing in commentaries from uh, a passage of scripture. Uh, in that case, you might be looking at, note that there's kind of different types of commentaries. There's things that are done from multi-volume commentaries. Uh, this is different than a commentary in a series. It's a little hard for me to explain that one here, but the idea is sometimes it's considered a series, sometimes it's considered volumes of a series. If that's the case, just kind of be paying attention to those details. Uh, we even have things for how you cite a commentary on Step Bible, an increasingly common uh, source here at Tyndale. Uh, just pay attention to some of the details are different in terms of titles of series are not italicized, but titles of multi-volume works are italicized, things like that. Uh, if you're going to be referencing scripture at any point, which I expect you probably will if you're doing something in, say, spiritual formation or something to do with preaching or leadership or things like that, uh, this tells you exactly what to do for scripture. It, it uh, explains that you need to include... Um, uh, as part of your text, you're going to include the, auth uh, the the book that it's coming from. If you're doing parenthetical, it's going to be as a short form. Uh, the first time you reference scripture, you're going to include the translation in uh, the abbreviated version of the translation. Uh, and then subsequent entries, assuming you don't use or assuming you use the same translation over and over, uh, then you can just do it like normal here. And note that you do not need to include sacred works like scripture in a reference list. So there is no entry for that. We have loads of other things. If you've got, say, a monograph or a thesis or a dissertation you're referencing, you'll notice that this looks a little bit similar to the chapter that we looked at earlier, other than it's going to have this note about what kind of thing it is, a research portfolio, and where it was completed. Uh, if you're going to use peer-reviewed journal articles, a very common thing, I just want you to note the significance of the volume number and the issue number that often goes with journal articles. Uh, if there is other date information, it goes there, the page range of the journal article, and then here is the DOI number as we've talked about. And these are just some examples. There are plenty of other things you can do here and take a look at in more detail for yourself if you want to play around with it. There's also a site that we regularly keep updated, so if we find errors or if uh, Turabian updates their information on something, then we try to update this page as quickly as we can. Now, you might be saying to yourself, Brent, what do I do if this the, the kind of source I'm using isn't on your academic integrity page? Well, that's where the manual is actually very helpful. Thankfully, the Trabian manual is not overly expensive. It's something you can pick up for relatively cheap on Amazon if you want to be able to, to look these things up for yourself. But if you're really stumped, just keep in mind the following information. Typically, this is what you're going to include in most of your references, the author's name, the date of publication, titles of chapters and books with additional editor information if necessary, publication data, URL if needed, 
But sometimes you might come across things that aren't even in the manual. What do you do then? Usually at that point, I recommend Frankenstein's monstering it. You're basically going to take two or maybe even three things from the manual and kind of try and piece together exactly what it is you're trying to cite. It's not going to be pretty all the time, but it's something that you can do. Uh, if you're really stumped, email us and we're happy to kind of work with you to try and figure out, okay, what is this source and how would it, what would be the, the most logical way to cite it? So we're happy to help you with that if you're stumped. And finally, I just wanted to go over a couple of generic writing tips for Turabian. Typically, the kinds of assignments you're going to be doing in, in, in your programs here at Tyndale where you use Turabian, it's going to be a mixture of reporting, arguing, and reflecting. So some of it's going to be personal reflection. Sometimes you're going to be summarizing things, and sometimes you're going to actually be trying to make arguments and proving things. So, so just keep in mind what it is you're actually writing about when you're writing. Um, the use of I or we is permitted in your papers, but try to stick with uh, only using those for reflection and autobiography. Uh, as written in the Doctor of Ministry Handbook, even when use of the first person could be justified, the presentation of your idea may be improved by writing in a more objective style. So look at this example. As I observed the communication styles of first-year Carolina women, I noticed frequent use of nonverbal cues. That sentence is perfectly legitimate, but for the sake of objectivity and for the sake of communicating your ideas effectively, it would probably be better to written as a study of the communication styles of first year Carolina woman revealed frequent use of nonverbal cues. Notice that it's still expressing the same idea, but without the use of I or we in there. Similarly, you're going to want to stick with active voice. This is where the subject, the doer of your sentence, is actually in the subject position. The church bought new resources. A study of the communication styles of First Year Carolina Woman revealed. You don't want to do passive voice. New resources were bought by the church. Uh, part of that is because this is just wordier, the second example, but also it's very easy to drop the by the church piece, the by portion. You can just say new resources were bought and we don't know, we don't know who did the buying. So in that case, as much as possible, stick with active voice where the true subject, the doer of the sentence is emphasized at the beginning of the sentence. This is actually just a good uh, piece of advice in general. Keep that clear, concise, and professional tone throughout. So as we see in this point here, we don't we want to try and begin with sentences with subjects and verbs. The researchers concluded. But you, you know, this also comes into how you communicate your ideas. You don't want to be making blanket statements about entire groups of people that you can't back up. You don't want to just say most people think blank because you think that way. These sweeping generalizations are actually very dangerous because if you don't have the data to back you up, your professor is going to be like, that's not true. So make sure that you're paying very close attention to whether or not you are making sweeping generalizations. And finally, just make sure that when you're doing your sentences, keep things clear and concise. They argued instead of they had an argument. Don't use these kind of like verb phrases over here. The results suggested rather than the results were suggestive of. Clear, concise, to the point. And that's really all I have for you today. Uh, if you want information about um, the in academic integrity stuff, I have the link here on the page for you with the uh, the link for the Turabian section that you can use. Uh, and as well, if you do have questions, you can always send us an email at writing at tyndale.ca and someone on our team will try and get back to you as quick as possible to answer your questions. But hopefully you found this helpful in, in preparing you for the kinds of writing that you're going to be doing in your program. I know, as I've said, this is especially valuable for the Doctor of Ministry program, and a lot of what we've talked about today is dealing with the nitty-gritty of formatting and, and referencing. So if you're stumped, send us an email, talk to your professors, but really this has hopefully just been a guide to help you uh, better prepare for your assignments. All the best as you write, and we look forward to maybe working with you here soon. Take care. Happy writing.